After construction of the Douglas D558-1 Sky Street began in 1946, U.S. aeronautical engineers began to take advantage of a tremendous amount of research on swept wing performance that was captured from Germany at the end of World War II. Because of the volume and quality of the research at their disposal, the Navy and the National Advisory Council on Aeronautics decided to amend their contract with Douglas for the D558 series planes. The second set of three aircraft were to become a swept wing test plane powered by both jet and rocket power. While this aircraft shared a contract, a designation, and even a number of components with the earlier Skystreak, the Douglas D558-2 Skyrocket was a very different animal with much greater performance potential. The primary goal of the D558-2 was to gather data on the behavior of swept wing aircraft at transonic and supersonic speeds, with particular attention being placed on an aerodynamic quirk known as pitch up, which is an uncommanded upward rotation of the aircraft. Many of the era's high performance aircraft suffered from the phenomenon and researchers were eager to learn more about the subject. The Sky Streak's Westinghouse J-34 jet engine was intended to be used for takeoff and climb, at which point the pilot could ignite a reaction motor's XLR-8 rocket engine, which was fed by alcohol and liquid oxygen. The aircraft would then land using the jet engine. Much like the X-2 and the D-558-1, the Dash-2 featured a forward fuselage escape capsule. In the event of an in-flight emergency, the pilot could separate the capsule, then leap free from the rear of the capsule and recover under an emergency chute. Like the Dash-1 variant, the Dash-2 was also built with a magnesium fuselage and aluminum wings. The original Skyrocket design called for a flush cockpit canopy, much like the Bell X-1. Pilot visibility was found to be unacceptable, so a raised canopy was designed and installed on the aircraft before the first flight. That first flight took place on February 4, 1948, with Douglas pilot John Martin at the controls. During the test program, the D-558-2 aircraft were fitted with a wide range of wing plan forms, including fixed and floating slats, wing fences, leading edge cord extensions, and even simulated external stores and fuel tanks. This work with these extras spelled the difference between a pure research aircraft and research with real-world weapons systems and marked a significant divergence from the Air Force's X-2 program, which was underway at Edwards at the same time. Performance with the hybrid jet rocket combo disappointed the Navy, so a decision was made to launch the Skyrocket from altitude using a modified B-29 bomber, which was known in the Navy as a P-2B. This would allow the D-558-2 to turn its minimal fuel load into greater performance and more data rather than simply scratching its way to altitude. Many prominent test pilots had the opportunity to fly the Skyrocket during its operational life, including John McKay, Bill Bridgman, and Marion Carl, who flew the bird to an unofficial altitude record in excess of 83,000 feet on August 21, 1953. Perhaps no pilot is more closely associated with the Skyrocket than Scott Crossfield, who became the first man to fly twice the speed of sound on November 20, 1953, when he reached Mach 2.005. The aircraft never exceeded Mach 2 again. All three of the Skyrockets survived the test program. Aircraft number one is currently located at the Plains of Fame Museum in Chino, California. Number two, the Mach 2 bird, is on display at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, while number three is displayed outside on a pedestal at Antelope Valley College in Palmdale, California, which is very near Edwards Air Force Base. A third variant of the series was seriously proposed to explore the transonic flight regime, and design work was undertaken on this, which was going to be called the Douglas D558-3 Skyflash. 
Work was eventually suspended due to the fact that the North American X-15 program was already well underway. Note that this third variant is not the production precursor that the original D-558 contract called for. Over its operational lifetime, the D-558-2 flew over 280 times and generated reams of valuable data that improved future aircraft, most notably many of the Century series of jet fighters. <laughs>